I've got a different theory, if that's okay, if I can have a third theory. Um, and uh, it goes like this. That yes, the world was created in six days, but that God spent billions of years thinking about it. Because it's an amazing world that we live in. And I think he was there with a drawing board, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I think they were there, poring over it and thinking, now, if we make this bit, what's going to happen to that bit over there? And if we make the earth this dense, without making lots of wiggly worms, how is it going to breathe and support life? I wonder if those sort of discussions were going... I think they had a lovely time thinking about creation. So that's where my imagination has gone. Anyway. Um, we've had a little bit of Swedish this morning, and uh, I'm going to bring a little bit of Hebrew to you, if I can. I'm, my pronunciation won't be any good, but you'll get the idea. So water is ha Mayan sky is Sha Mayan and the heavens are Ha Sha Mayan. So they're very similar words that all have a sort of watery theme. What I'm trying to get at is this that God has created the water the sky, I mean, it's, it's a very similar word to water, which you'll know if you've lived in Britain a long time. It rains a lot, um, as my wife's always telling me. It's not like this in America. Anyway, um, so you've got the water above and the water below. But actually, the heavens have a watery element. We know it's got the river of life in it. And um, I think... That is here on purpose at the beginning of the Bible to reassure us in a way that actually what we are looking forward to in heaven is not going to be a complete shock to us. We're getting little glimpses here on earth, probably tiny glimpses really, but little glimpses of what heaven is going to be like. So there's a little bit of... Hebrew for you. Now, I don't know, um, are any of you artists here? Raise a hand. Yes, we've got at least one, two, a few. So if you're doing a picture, there's one up here, um, you probably do the background first and then fill in the details. Does that sound about right normally? Or... No, that's fine. You don't have to do drawings like me. Anyway, that's how I do a picture. So, um, we have got in this creation narrative light and dark. So, light and dark. There we are. Um, and then we've got um, waters above and below, and then the land. So, light and dark on day one. On day four, we've got the sun and the moon and the stars. So, he's got the light and the dark, and then he's filling in the detail of that bit. And then, there's the waters above and below. Below, we've got all the fish and things swimming around. Above, we've got the birds flying around in the sky. So, that's day two and day five. And then we've got the background uh, on day three, the ground, and on day six, all the living creatures that move around. So it's a lovely picture of what creation is like and of the way God has designed our wonderful world. Now, I know we're not coming on to... Um, us yet but there's a lovely bit in Psalm 8 that I'd like to read to you and it says this when I consider the heavens 
the moon and the stars that you've put in place. What are men and women that you care about them? The sons of men and women that you're mindful of them. Why do you care about us? And yet, I think God has spent so much time making this wonderful world for us with the pinnacle of his creation. He's made it for us to enjoy and to look after. So, at the beginning, we've got darkness, chaos, disorder. If you want a little bit more Hebrew, it's tohu vavohu. Sounds a bit dark and chaotic. Tohu vavohu. Um, the earth being empty and formless. And then we've got the spirit, the ruach, the breath of God hovering over the face of the waters. So we've got darkness over the face of the waters and then we've got the spirit just hovering there. And then the drama, let there be light. And those are the first recorded words of God. They're the divine beginning to creation. In Latin, my father-in-law would tell you, is fiat lux, fiat lux. I'm not quite sure of the pronunciation. I'm not, no good at that. Anyway, let there be light. And that is really, really important. Now, I don't know if all of you here live with somebody else or have lived with somebody else at some stage. But when you have, maybe you've got up one morning, you've had to catch a train or get off somewhere, and um, you've woken up really early, it's still dark, and you've thought to yourself, I don't want to wake the other people up in my house. So, you sneak out of bed, Open and close the doors really quietly. Open and close the cupboards quietly to get your cereal out. You pour the cornflakes out one by one so they don't make a noise in the bowl. And you're really, really quiet. You're moving around the house. And then, wow, as you step on the cat um, or something like that happens. And um, you hear this voice from somewhere else in the house You've woken me up. Sorry. Why don't you just turn the light on? I'm awake now. I can't go back to sleep. And so you turn the light on and um, make lots of apologies. Um, The fact is that the darkness is confusing. It's hard to know what goes on when it's dark or what is around us. And darkness can represent just normal darkness and light. It can also be uh, sin and then goodness for the light, or actually death and life. So we've got those contrasts between darkness and light. So the light is really important. And it's, there's a, a peculiar verse in the Bible that says that to God, darkness and light are both alike. And I think, in a way, God didn't really need to create light. Maybe he could see in the dark, I don't know. But I think he's created light for our benefit, so that we can see clearly what's going on around us. And I don't just mean the physical light. What I'm talking about here is Jesus, the light of the world, coming into our world and bringing a new light that will change and transform people's lives. Just like that, let there be light. Here's Jesus coming in to our world an incredible moment in history 
which has now gone on forever. So, we've got that light, Jesus breaking the powers of darkness. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. That's what we read in John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word. That's how that little bit starts. Jesus is the light that has come into the confusion of darkness to say, actually, there's a new story going on here. I've come to fulfill all that we thought about in the beginning, and I'm going to make it right. Goodness comes in with Jesus. Jesus' death on the cross breaks the power of sin. And then at the resurrection, we have that light. At Jesus' death, the curtain is torn in two. The curtain in the temple, if you don't know about that, you can talk to me about it afterwards, but the curtain in the temple where only very, um, the most important priest at one moment of the year really had an opportunity to go in there and, um, and meet with God and arrange things in that bit of the temple. Um, but now everyone has access to God. At Jesus' death, there's no more separation. Jesus has made a way through death and into life. And then we see at the resurrection that light shining forth. Now, I feel I should um, just talk about what we did as a family yesterday. Um, So we went up to see The Lion King at the theatre. And um, I had this talk in mind a little bit because I don't know if you've ever had the privilege of going to see that production. But um, the way the people move the animals around, I mean, it's hard to describe, but it's absolutely incredible. And um, you've got all these different creatures, especially the opening scene, the circle of life. And uh, they're all moving around, interacting. It's absolutely fantastic. Anyway, it was at the Lyceum, And a funny thing happened to me on the way to the Lyceum Theatre. We went up and uh, we were going to lay some flowers at Buckingham Palace, which we've chosen from the garden. And we saw these people lined along the mall. And we went up and we said, what's happening? And um, three lovely little Scottish ladies... Um, from Edinburgh, I'm sorry, they weren't from Wick. Um, They told us what was going on, and they said, oh, King Charles is in St. James's Palace at the moment, uh, being instituted, and he's going to come along the mall and go to Buckingham Palace. So if you wait here, he'll, he'll be here at quarter past 11. And we'd arrived just before 11, so that was perfect. So we stood there waiting, we waited a bit longer, and uh, we asked a local Bobby on his beach what was going on, and he had a walkie-talkie, and he said, I'm communicating with people, but I've no idea. So um, anyway, at 12 o'clock, King Charles arrived, and um, it was lovely. So we saw our new king go past in his car, and he waved. I I like to think he waved to us, but he was waving to everyone. Um, And it was a really special moment. And then we walked on um, and laid our flowers as uh, 
in honor of our queen and then walked on to the theater. It was really a, a really interesting day out. So we had the king, we had the lion king, but for us here, Jesus is our king. There's a lovely verse, I think it's in Philippians, where it says this, shine like a star in the universe to the glory of God the Father. And I was reflecting on how our queen shone like a star in the universe. That's how I'd like to describe her. She reflected the likeness of Christ. She was a servant queen. And now she has stood before our servant king. Who came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, he paid with his life that we might have life forevermore. Our Queen showed great hospitality at Buckingham Palace, and she is now enjoying the hospitality of the heavenly banquet. And we pray for God's grace that King Charles, that her heirs and successors will reign with the same humility, service, and hospitality. We pray that our king on this earth would turn to our heavenly king and know him. But I'm not going to finish with our king. I'm going to finish with the king, as I think our Queen Elizabeth would have wanted. Jesus is the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. The Alpha and the Omega. Jesus is the light of the world that has come into the darkness. Now as I was thinking about the Spirit hovering over the waters... I was just thinking of our faces, our lives, reflecting the likeness of Christ as the Spirit hovers over us, if you like, or in us. That our friends, our neighbours, our family, strangers, enemies even, would see the light of Christ as we live together as church and as we go about in our community. Amen.